Hello, welcome back everybody. I hope you all had a, a good break, managed to get out of your chair and walk around a little bit. Um, and we are gonna get flying off to the second half of our afternoon. And um, I'm delighted to be introducing Dr. Alex Lai. Alex is a first five GP based in South London, and he's got a particular interest in GP wellbeing and mental health. His session with us today will look at how we can best face the challenges we may face with some strategies from coaching and all of this is inspired by his own personal experiences. So Alex, take it away. Great, right, can you hear me? Yep, all good. Perfect, all right. Uh, well, hello everyone uh, and thank you for having me to speak at your conference and thank you to all the other speakers for their brave storytelling. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about my story of facing adversity and how I think I overcame it with a bit of persistence, perspective and people power. At some point you will or may have already faced a life-changing adversity and if not you then a loved one. So today I'd like you to consider how will you respond and what determines that response. Next slide please. So I'm a salary GP with several roles working for the RCGP, um, HEE and LMC, as well as running my own organization focused on workplace wellbeing called Work Well Doctors, uh, which may sound like a lot, uh, but they all fit under what I like to call my umbrellas. Next slide, please. So they're essentially my values. So what I'm passionate about and what give me purpose. So I value connection, whether that's with my patients and, you know, really hearing about someone's story or with my colleagues and that's part of why I've got involved with RCGP as well as growth um, in terms of learning and that's why I, I got into medical student teaching um, as well as getting involved in various roles where I can learn more um, and then support and community and, and that's part of why I'm involved with HE and some of the other roles and they took me a while to work out and crystallize but once you do it can really help guide you to decide how to shape your career and your life as a GP. Next slide, please. So to work them out, I had to try a lot of different things. Uh, now, this is a bit of an overwhelming slide, I realize, um, but I show this to you to portray how no career path is smooth. As you can see, you know, over my, my training time, I tried lots of different things. And it's unlikely you know what your career is going to look like as a GP. And you may start off with multiple interests. And I fully encourage you to explore each one. And that's how you'll work out what you're passionate about and what your sort of purpose and drive to continue to be a great GP will be. And certainly, as you can see during training and, and first five, I've tried all of these things because it's all interesting. But I did have to ask myself, um, next slide, please. Essentially one, what keeps me running and feeling inspired? So really finding that meaning. We're quite fortunate in medicine to, to already have a sense of purpose because we know that we wanted to help people. And, and you know, if you talk about grass is greener, I remember this med student who I bumped into a couple of years after med school and he'd left medicine for the city. And he, and he said, you know, he really misses having that sense of purpose. So. So thinking about when you're doing stuff, what are you doing it for? What, what you know, gives you that sort of energy um, and makes you feel good uh, at the end of the day where you go home and you tell your, your, your spouse or, or whoever you live with, you know, oh God, you know, this amazing thing happened and, and you really felt you were able to help a patient. Secondly, what brings me joy? So ask yourself, what brings me joy and doesn't feel like a chore? And ideally bring it into your workplace. So I've met some fantastic people who, you know, they're dance teachers and they've brought that into becoming a physical champion, Varsity GP. And, you know, I've uh, been part of a choir um, that we set up during the junior doctor strikes. And I really enjoyed that for that sense of community as well as creativity. Um, and, you know, we actually do some NHS activism on the side. And so I've managed to sort of incorporate the two um, and we've done performances to raise awareness of privatization in the NHS and, and you know, pr promote and um, let public uh, perception of what's going on be, be wider. And then thirdly, 
think about what am I reading into? So rather than it being like, oh, you know, I'm reading this for CBT, what do I want to read into? What, what do I pick up? What do I buy from the shop? And who am I following? Who inspires me? Who am I surrounding myself by? And those are the things that you really want to continue down on that path. But before any of this, I'm really here to share a formative experience that really shaped uh, where I am now and my current values, my roles as umbrellas. Um, so back in September 2017, um, my partner and I had been together for several years uh, and I was already aware he suffered from depression um, and had faced um, a great deal of adversity prior to us meeting. And we had recently moved to Putney and I was in the first year of my GP training at George's. And in the midst of my neurosurgery rotation, don't ask, <laughs> um, you know, it was something that I hadn't necessarily wanted to do, but you know, it was, we were making the most of it. I remember I had control over who was my supervisor. So I picked the pediatric neurosurgery consultant. Um, and I said, you know, I want to, uh, use this time to revise for my DCH. Um, and you know, it was busy. They had these ridiculous sort of 7 a.m. Uh, radiology meetings, and you know, it was a bit understaffed, but there was team camaraderie. Um, and so it was all right. And you know, I was like, okay, this is six months, we'll get through it. There's a finite period. And then, you know, things weren't quite right at home. Uh, and I just remember at work, receiving some alarming texts, um, which were to signify the beginning of his first episode of mania with psychosis. Um, so what ensued was really a swirling tumultuous period of GP encounters and a and &E presentations, you know, being on that other side. And I remember um, just being in St. George's A&E and the uh, liaison psychiatry uh, nurse was was in the middle and I and you know after a bit of a wait you know it's suddenly be, having that other experience I, I just went up to her and I was like oh you know um, you know I understand it's busy just uh, just wondered how, how long it might be and she she was like oh you know um, sort of with a kind of nonchalant oh you're clearly fine um, you know, we'll, we'll be with you as soon as possible. And I was like, oh, I, I'm not the patient. The patient is, is there hiding, looking from behind the door with the door, you know, peeking through. And she was like, oh, uh, you know, and, and it was episodes like that. And, you know, there were some terrifying discussions about wanting to drill into his head to get the voices out. Um, and, you know, coping with side effects from every trial of medication that we went through. and you know, trying to work together to make sure to combat a lanzapine and, and actually, you know, being on that other side and seeing the effects of that and, you know, trying to be a, a good informed doctor, but that's not really my role here, um, you know, but being a good partner in, in, in ensuring like we're still eating well and, and trying to live well. And eventually um, this culminated in a psych admission um, and I remember it clearly, it's just before my first residential. Um, meanwhile, I was still going to work. Uh, if anything, I overcompensated uh, and I kept going, um, perhaps even threw myself into it more. Um, as you may notice, uh, we often do as doctors, perhaps as a distraction, perhaps it's an act of feeling in control at work um, or because we're all fighters and you know, having worked so hard to get where we are, you know, uh, I'm trying still to reflect back on, on what keeps me going. But what I want to share is, I guess, my biggest mistake that I, you know, you've probably heard from, but that was not seeking support. You know, there was perhaps a stigma in this case, uh, separate to those personal stories we've heard of mental health, whereby it wasn't so much my illness to tell, I do now have his permission, um, but I also thought that we could manage it ourselves, you know, very independent. Uh, there's been some research done into to GPs and the type of people that go into general practice and how 
independent they are, how creative they are, but also how much they, they have auth autonomy. Um, and it's, you know, it was a definite thing that I would, I would change and which I have changed now. You know, in the winter, I did tell my parents and some close friends, and it was easier having confided in people rather than, you know, lying about why I was missing things or having to change work shifts. Um, but unfortunately, he did have another episode in February the following year, um, just as I was about to switch to peds. And this time I did speak up. So I sought help from the fantastic GPs who had helped him. And for the first time, I got signed off for a period myself. Um, and similar to Duncan, that came with an element of guilt. And how do I spend this time when I should be working? But I think there is an element of accepting that guilt, you know, and recognizing that, you know, common adage of, you know, needing to look after yourself because I'm no good to anyone else if I don't put my own oxygen mask on first. And I ended up having to extend that period of leave for a little bit um, because almost counterintuitively, I was really anxious about returning to work. And that's not something I'd necessarily experienced before. Um, and having now missed the first week of peds where in your head you think, oh, that's, that's when all the nurses and the doctors will be accommodating. But then after that, everyone expects you to know how to cannulate a baby. So I spoke to my consultant supervisor and she was so supportive and she referred me to occupational health and staff support. And I did continue to see them in further episodes throughout training. And I also contacted PHP, uh, which was useful too. Although perhaps the funniest thing I remember her saying was, you always talk about how your partner is, but how are you? And so ha perhaps that's a poignant lesson as well for us all when we focus on others and don't give enough time to ourselves. So it's been a big part of our lives and we've also learned to not let it dominate our lives. Um, how to balance that doctor patient role versus having a relationship and bringing in factors of resilience, you know, but more than just bounce back, you know, it's learning from each episode. And because we know there will be more bumps in the road, it's how to preempt them, how to notice those early warning signs for both of us, whether it's mania or severe depression or burnout for myself and making sure that once I notice those earlier signs, once I've taken the time to think about what they are for me or what others might notice for myself is another good way of looking at it. Then I know that actually I might need to seek some help because another mistake we're often thinking is that only at the point of burnout or only at the point of severity should we seek help. Whereas in actual fact, there is a good lesson in resilience as well about being proactive and you know stopping it before we slide off that scale. Whew. So uh, this is what developed my foray into mental health and well-being. And I'll take a pause there because if in the next slide, I want to show you this coaching tool um, that we did during my training. I'm currently doing a diploma in coaching um, called the River of Life. And it's an exercise where you draw all the bad events on one side and good events on the other side of the bank. However, I wasn't a fan of that terminology of bad or negative. So I prefer to think of it as uh, drawing sort of things that shouldn't have happened. For example, uh, my point might not work on this screen, but earlier on in my, my life, I was bullied for being gay, you know, or something, for example, outside of your control. So for example, your partner losing their job. Um, and if we just do one more click, please, Louise. So just zooming in on to really uh, my GP training, uh, so the, the first arrow part is actually F1, F2, and then the little arrow is F3, and then the main part is GP training. And then I've really only been qualified since January 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. But back in 2017, I was already an activist after the junior doctor's strikes, um, 
having been through support myself and seeing morale and burnout rates so high in hospital, you know, at the time that we had terrible retention, loads of people were leaving medicine to go to Australia. And so I took the opportunity to train as a trust health and well-being ambassador. And from there, I connected with so many people's stories and I started to focus on work culture and well-being. And my experience of becoming a mental health carer made me rethink my priorities. And, and that's something we might have to do throughout our careers. And so I planned ahead. And during that PEDS rotation, I actually applied to go less than full time. Um, and this then led me to learn about the difficulties um, that they face, um, whether it's people returning from maternity or paternity care or those who are out of program for whatever reason. Um, and I took up an opportunity to support them with uh, a community, online community. And that's how I've gone on to become a, a champion for supportive return to training. So it, it's kind of like when something happens and then you find that silver lining, what this exercise can do is once you do take some time, and I, I really compel you to, to just set aside 30 minutes to do this, is just, you know, go out into a garden or go to a park, put aside your phone, you're meant to do it on a piece of paper, you're meant to get those creative juices going. But whatever works for you, whether it's a PowerPoint and some images or scribbling on a piece of paper or getting out some pens and paints and, and, and drawing it out for yourself and do it from birth and see where your life has taken. Because we don't often take that time. Because then, you know, after that, I set up the Resilient Doc or, as a blog on Instagram um, to reflect on my experiences, uh, you know, how I was feeling, what I was learning. And that's moved on now and grown into this lovely community of like-minded individuals who I can learn from. And, and we also support each other. And it's a way where actually it also gives me a feeling of purpose, being able to, you know, some of it is just mindless and it might be like a cooking recipe, but some of it, you know, I've been open such as today and I, and I hope that you know it resonates with some of you um, and perhaps makes things a little easier um, and then finally at the bottom here so I, I got involved with the LMC over COVID uh, I, I stepped up to become chair and that's been a, a fantastic experience to advocate for GPs and primary care you know on a more systemic level to try and push back against workload sort of dumping from secondary care and other issues in terms of ICS and making sure that, you know, there's a voice for primary care as well as for our patients. And then I co-founded the Work Well Doctors just prior to the pandemic to help other healthcare professionals, you know, address not only the individual factors, but also the systemic issues, you know, looking at work culture, looking at how we manage our time and, you know, how the team dynamic is what's the communication when you know someone's off sick or there's a complaint made you know are you supported by your partners and your practice manager and i think really I, that's pointed out to me the silver lining of this pandemic and i've been able to hold on to that because for me it's shone a real spotlight on healthcare professional well-being and it really feels like the tide is slowly turning. The more we see it as the norm and a priority, the more our work environment will improve. So the point of this exercise is to reflect on your life experiences, right? And the formative things that shaped who you are. But it can also help you pick out those common themes I talked about, the values, you know, what's meaningful to you, um, and, and how it's all connected. And it's really nice to look at, you know, how something that's on one side of the bank sort of has shaped the other things that you take up in your career. Another thing that's really important in terms of being a good GP is boundaries, right? You know, I think in medicine, you know, if you think back to when we were applying, we were doing all of these things to get into med school. When we were in med school, everything was volunteer, be on this society, for, for, for a lot of us. Um, and actually, we don't have infinite time anymore. And it is difficult when you are working. And so 
having these values and working out these values can help set those boundaries and, and make you feel more comfortable and less guilty perhaps about saying no to some things and saying no to people because once you work them out and once you do a timetable of, of what your career looks like as a GP, you can see how much time you've got. And if they're not fitting under those umbrellas, you know, although I'm really interested in say digital health tech, actually, you know, I, I'm going to have to say no because I, I don't have the space for it. And, and those may change throughout your career, but it just makes you feel more comfortable with those decisions. And just remember the perfect work-life balance is always going to be fluctuating. So for me, I've definitely learned and I'm continuing to learn even this year. So obviously last year we had less social engagements. Our weekends were freer. I have taken on a lot of roles, but I've had to rejig that, you know, um, back in January and then March and, and just reshuffle because every time my partner does become unwell, things tend to topple down. So what I need to make sure of is that I have that buffer. You know, I don't take on too many sessions so that if there is something that goes wrong, I, I have the space, not only, you know, in terms of time, but in spent mind space to be able to cope with that as well. Another thing um, this exercise does is help you pause uh, and recognize all of your accomplishments because Again, it's not something we commonly do, you know, you know, there's, there's a humility amongst GPs, um, you know, even just this phrase, which I, I, I still dislike, just a GP, but, you know, there is a humility to it. And um, sometimes that can go into the negative in terms of imposter syndrome and not feeling confident. So often just reminding yourself of how far you've come can help combat that imposter syndrome, as well as any feelings of persecution or, or why has this happened to me? Because noticing the positives will help combat that feeling. And lastly, it can provide that sort of perspective on the adversities and point out the silver linings from each sort of event that shouldn't have happened or was outside of your control. And those really form the key messages I want to share from my experience of what makes me a GP. Um, so in the next slide, the first one really is take or make some time to reflect. So through this pandemic, I've realized how important it is for me to block out times um, and still take annual leave because even if we can't travel abroad, you know, I think we all need that break from decision-making and constant responsibility, you know, somewhere to where we can turn off. And also I, I used to use the, the bus or the train um, as a way, of, as a time to reflect because there was no Wi-Fi, and, and I am a creation of our, our generation. But of course that stopped during the pandemic. So now I have to find a place. I have to actively think about where I can go without distraction and make that time because I know that that time to reflect, you know, however works for you, I, you know, I do it on my phone in a, in a sort of uh, create a draft email and then they're all saved there in my drafts. I just put a date, but it just means that if I'm in that flow, I can just write about what I'm feeling or actually Instagram has been helpful for me because I've, learned a lot over the, the pandemic about, you know, staying authentic to, to why I started it. And that was really just to share what was going on. Um, and by thinking about how I wanted to, to frame what I was saying, it's often helped me to, to gain some perspective on, on what's going on. And, and don't forget chatting with your fellow GPs and your VTS colleagues and hopefully moving on then to your first five group can be just as therapeutic. And so the second one links in with that and that's having a compassionate perspective mindset. So that's, that's more to do with the fact that I guess Jamie, my partner has taught me a lot. Um, being a mental health carer and being on the other side of the healthcare system has taught me a lot. Um, and we're currently in a GP crisis. We may always be in a GP crisis. So it's something to remember that, you know, 
there are black and white videos of when the NHS started where GPs are like, this is the worst time it's ever been. And it can be easy to slip into that feeling of sort of being the victim. Um, and it helps to step back and take a moment to pause if you find yourself getting irritated or upset, you know, whether that's by a patient and the way that they may be accusing you of something or, or getting very angry and frustrated. But, you know, actually, is, is that a relative who's angry and frustrated because they're upset and they're scared and, and maybe it's not an attack at you, but because they feel a lack of control. And sometimes that means that it won't ruin our day necessarily if we're able to take that step back. Or maybe a colleague snaps at you, you know, the partner says something at you and, and then they rush past. And if you catch them for a chat, you know, you might find that they're rushed off their feet because their child is ill and actually they're rushing to get work done because they need to get home to, to childcare or to pick them up or, you know, something else is going on at home. Or actually I, I was working at a place where they always, I knocked on the door and they were like, what do you want? And it felt very abrupt, but actually they were probably suffering from burnout themselves. So just taking that moment to, to think about things from the other person's point of view can help. And then the third one is, is have the humility to learn. So in terms of what makes a GP, you know, this, this actually came from a really good colleague and friend um, who, I, I asked, you know, I said, I'm doing this talk and, and it had been after, you know, actually there was a mental health crisis um, and it had been a difficult time. And she was like, wow, well, you know, how do you do it? And I was like, how do I do it? Uh, and she said, one on reflection, but two, with this humility to learn, it can really apply to being a good GP because in a way we can learn from our patients, but also we will never know it all and that's okay. And also there are always things we can learn from our colleagues, no matter what level, you know, I've been doing work with frontline colleagues from all, all stages in terms of wellbeing, you know, from receptionists to consultant supervisors, and actually, you know, the receptionists are a real front line in GP. They protect us from so much abuse and, and, you know, working together as a team to work out how we can reduce that has been really informative and, and a learning experience. And the more we learn, the more we are able to adapt to new challenges and also affect change and make a difference to ourselves, our team, our patients and general practice as a whole. So finally, I'd want you to see the silver linings in life. You know, I'm not saying that everything is, you know, perfect in any shape or form. And, and certainly let's not slip into toxic positivity, but there is a skill in focusing on, you know, the, the small positives, those things that do give us that joy at work and making sure that we aren't getting dragged down by, you know, sometimes, within medicine, you, you've all probably met that doctor who's really cynical and unhappy. And no matter what you say, they're like, oh, it's rubbish and, you know, uses some profanity. But, you know, we can, and there's good research in terms of retraining our brain and, and in terms of neuroscience that we can learn to appreciate, you know, what is good that has happened today and notice what did, make me have a good day today what difference did I make and also what did I learn and also congratulate yourself if you achieved anything oh you know I've never managed to make this I don't know emis thing work or I've never managed to convince her to not take zopiclone and just see events that you face not as setbacks but really as an opportunity to grow thank you so on the next slide, I just put together, oh, sorry. Uh, you never know where something might lead you. So, you know, if you'd asked me back in training, uh, you know, I never could have imagined that I could have got to this point, you know, and the choir stuff, 
we raised loads of money for mental health charities. I've sang at RCGP. And then through that, which started with the NHS choir, um, at, you know, that ended up uh, turning into a, a big thing. And then we were invited to sing in New York. So I've sang in Carnegie Hall um, just before COVID. So, so fortunate there. And, you know, with the Work Well Doctors, I've had the opportunity to work with loads of LMCs and trusts and RCGP and practitioner health. And, and you know, I'm finding real joy and passion in that um, and work with the RCGP and, and, and win this award. So just if you do find those values and, and, and your passions and your purpose, then, then people will see it and there'll be more opportunities, but just remember those boundaries. And then the last slide is just some support. So if anything has resonated with you, obviously it's not an interactive slide, but they will be sending them out after, but there is the practitioner health service. The RCGP wellbeing um, have a lot of resources there for you. Um, there's some, if you're struggling financially, you know, if your, your partner or spouse has struggled, yeah, you know, actually, during this pandemic, my partner's been shielding and that's been a whole new bucket of lessons to learn and adapt and change to. Um, and then the BMA and there's also Frontline 19. So I'm happy to be open and, and say I've accessed them for therapy and I'm still talking to a counselor uh, with some of the difficulties. Um, there's also Duty to Care and through Duty to Care, it's another free charity organization that has therapists and nutritionists and uh, all, all manner of other sort of professionals that can help you if you're struggling. And remember, you don't need to wait till the worst point to seek help. You know, let's be proactive here. Um, and there's you okay doc as well. All right, that's me done. Um, if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Alex. That's great. And I have to say, Alex has always been a big inspiration to me. We trained in the same patch sort of in South of London. So I keep seeing Alex wherever I go doing some great work. So um, thank you very much for sort of sharing your insights into that. And I think one of the things that you've said, again, I've taken lots of things from everything everybody said today, but it's about not seeing necessarily things as setbacks, but actually the opportunities that they could be. That's, that's some really sound advice, Alex. We've got some questions actually so I'm gonna I'm gonna go straight on to those so um, one of the questions is um, thank you for sharing your story and your partner's story very humbling and encouraging at the same time and their question is how does one go about getting involved with training as being a well-being ambassador or getting involved in that kind of work so um check out at your trust uh so that started with I was at St. George's Trust and it was a new thing to cope with this retention and burnout and demoralization. Um, so your staff, uh, there, there might be a staff wellbeing hub at your trust. You know, RCGP has a wellbeing committee. You know, if you're an AIT or if you're first five, there's various areas to get involved with. Um, contact some people uh, who inspire you who are doing similar things and see what they got involved with. Um, certainly with the new junior doctor contracts uh, rules, there are LTFT and um, other various rep roles within that. Uh, so maybe check out our committee or if you're a trainee, become a trainee rep and say you, you want to you know, take charge of wellbeing. Absolutely. I totally echo what Alex has said. And so the RCGP have an AIT advisory network um, and it's open to anyone who is an AIT. So if you want to get involved, find someone in your local training scheme or part of your local faculty who will be able to help you how to get onto that. Um, and if you want to be starting up something that's for trainee well-being or something like that in your patch, start it, go for it. You will find yeah. like-minded people. I think Alex will agree with me. There's lots to be said about being on committees and sitting in meetings but if there's you've got a really good idea there's nothing better than just getting getting that started the best you can what, what would you say Alex absolutely absolutely and and that was one thing I did want to say you know because you know obviously I've faced imposter syndrome as well and actually do, when you do that exercise you realize okay it's not always on age we're taught so much about hierarchy in medicine but then you 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 
you, you find all of these fantastic people who have done things no matter what stage they're at in life, because we all have different experiences and different things to teach others and learn from others. So if you do have that passion, then, then follow through with it and be confident with it and start something. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess one of the things, Alex, is I, I see you around because you're involved in so much, which is really great. I, I personally have to say, I don't quite know how you do it. But I guess one of my questions is, how do you prevent that from all getting on top of you? I know you said, you know, making regular breaks and things, but given the fact you're still working as a GP, you're doing your well-being work, the coaching, singing in a choir, and you've got, you know, spending time with your partner, how, how can you can you balance it all, all the time? Is there a secret to success? <laughs> uh, the secret to success is remembering, there is no secret to success. No, um, remembering that it is constantly changing. So if, if you found that training slide overwhelming, don't forget uh, I went less than full time and I never would have had that, you know, uh, that time necessarily to do so many things. You know, once Jamie was better, things could pick up. If he got worse, then things had to be pulled back. Um, having that buffer of a lesson full time definitely helped a bit. So also don't compare yourself to others um, and, and think about how are they doing it? Because, you know, no, no one's perfect. And I've certainly made plenty of mistakes. And, and it's often when you make that mistake, it's like, ah, okay, now is the time to reassess. So as I was saying, you know, during the pandemic, it was, less busy and it didn't matter if there were evening webinars and you know meetings here and there and I had a lot and I was doing two two GP was working at two GP practices but then you know once it hit sort of January February March and I was like I'm not terribly happy here but also things are getting worse and I also haven't taken much break so actually I reduced my hours so I only do four sessions now um, and that allows me time to do all the other stuff and that might change and again that's perfectly fine you know it was such a revolution revelation to to go I have control here you know as I think it was Duncan and Fazana said you know for the first time in our in our careers we have real control to say no actually I don't want to work here there's plenty more fish in the sea and that's all right. I might change my mind later and that's all right. So I might do four sessions now for a period, then I might step up to five or I might locum or I might, you know, switch practices later on and, and nothing's permanent, everything changes and it's how we adapt, but just recognizing early on that it's okay to adapt. Exactly, and I think it's that one size does not fit all and yes. more, you know, more prevalent than ever. There will be lots of people listening who have come to GP training straight from F2. Some people have done breaks. Some people have done other careers, maybe not even within mm. medicine. And, you know, we're all different, but that so sort of wide array is what makes us GPs. That's what brings us yes. to cater for our, you know, ever diversifying populations and people who need us. Yes. So. Yeah. And oftentimes I very much agree with your point, Alex, about things um, not comparing yourselves to others. I think as medics, sometimes we are just hardwired to do that in terms of the system of medical school that we go through. But often hmm. it looks too good to be true. It usually is. And it's you've got to find yeah. the right for you. And I think one of the questions um, sort of tied into that and you telling us about going less than full time and, and taking a break and things like that is, do you have any practical tips about perhaps how you dealt with maybe the anxieties about returning to work and going back into you know, placements and doing things like that. Sure. So hopefully if you are returning from a period away, um, you've accessed some form of support, whether that's PHP or a support group. Um, if you're a trainee, you know, there is the supported return to training. If you're a, a GP, there are uh, various places you can seek support. So the LMC has some workshops for returning mothers, um, certainly leaning into your, your GP support network. Um, and in terms of physically dealing with anxieties, take it back to the fact that you do have a lot of training. If there's specific areas that you are concerned about, then make sure you ask, you know, if it's returning to a practice, speak to the practice manager, speak to you know, the partner or whoever is supervising you and just say, I have some concerns about this, 
you know how are you able to support me you know who can I speak to on the day or I'm not comfortable working on my own in this practice remember similar to think about how you would advise a friend or an F1 starting up recently we approached for some F1 advice and it's like remember you you are part of a team although we work in silo you're still part of a team and you should be able to ask them questions and feel more comfortable definitely and i think oftentimes we find ourselves giving really good advice to our family members and to friends but not necessarily reflecting that back on ourselves and you're right taking that time to step back and think what advice would i give to somebody else and does that apply to me yeah. And as you say, speaking to other people in your team, and there will always be instances, and I'm sure lots of people in the group may feel like this, that the person that you're supposed to go to isn't the person you necessarily are able to speak to, but there will be other people and it's finding yes. another avenue and not giving up at that first hurdle um, or asking mm -hmm. for help at that time. And that fits quite well into sort of the next question, Alex, I've got for you, which is um, someone's asked, have you had any specific mentors? And if so, how did you find people that resonated with you and your values? Um, so I, I've just signed up to a mentor scheme that comes as part of the fellowship, uh, the SPIN Fellows. Um, haven't met them yet. I have, I have a really good team at the practice I work at and I, and I mesh really well. And you'll know when you connect with someone and you're able to have those chats. And that's part of, uh, you know, a different talk I'm doing, but working out your priorities. So there was an earlier question about finding the right practice for you. And you've got to think about what you want from a practice. So, you know, if your priority is becoming a partner, then it, it, you know, a set practice might be right for you if they're offering those learning opportunities to work it out. For me, I know that I wear my heart on my sleeve and, you know, working at the practice I'm at now where I feel comfortable talking about if Jamie's unwell um, and they mm -hmm. understand and they ask as well. You know, it's so important to have those colleagues who ask and, and know about what's going on so that they know when something's wrong, so that they know, you know, if you need to take some time. Um, and it, sorry, I've forgotten the original question. Um, so it's talking about um, mentors and finding someone that aligns with you, but I think you, you have answered yeah. that. Alex, so yeah, I, I think that's why I join certain committees, um, you know, next generation GP when I was in training and finding people who were passionate about the healthcare system and affecting change and, you know, joining RCGP wellbeing and, you know, I, I found someone who really did align with my values in terms of trying to understand burnout and work culture. And, and that's why I set up the Work World Doctors with them. And, you know, if you are passionate about something, that's the benefit of joining and, and connecting with these networks, because then you will find people who are also passionate. And if you're like me, then it, it bolsters you and, and you're almost more productive working together with someone. And, and you know, that's that's a real benefit exactly and I think there there are so many like-minded individuals out there we just have to have that yeah. uh, you know desire to go and seek them out and I suppose it was earlier in the chat and I don't know if other people saw it but the RCGP do have a mentor scheme as well and people can sign up for that and it's all about finding like-minded individuals that may not be in your patch but you know you're working less than full time or struggling with mental health or indeed you're a mum or anything there's you know there's innumerable um different permutations of that um one of the questions that has come up alex is uh, so do you have ever have days when your partner's mental health sticks with you at work so um in the context of sometimes it's really difficult to leave home life at home when things aren't in a good place any any particular tips for that absolutely uh in terms of answering the first part there, there have definitely been days and and that's where it's helpful that work know what's going on you know, so during training my supervisor knew what was going on and currently you know uh one of the gp partners she can tell as soon as i walk in that something's wrong and she'll be like are you all right you know are you really all right you know and and it'll be like okay you know you're all right to work in terms of turning that switch off and putting up that boundary, it depends what's worrying you. So say, for example, you've had an argument and no one's talking. 
and you're and you're waiting for a text you know i've learned to just say you know okay i'm here fretting so let's just say we you know rather than us checking our phones i'm go i'm going to, we'll, we'll have a chat later um because i don't know about you but i'm constantly checking my phone and, and i'm worried um or if they were unwell you know can you do a check in with me so that i'm not worried at work um you know leaning on support you know unfortunately there isn't much family around us but we do have some good friends you know do they have someone else and can you sort of delegate a little bit in terms of of that responsibility so that it isn't interrupting things and then i guess with patience there is something to be said for, for sort of drawing in uh, and just remembering actually, okay, I'm going to put this aside now, making an active uh, sort of step to say, I'm going to put my phone in the drawer and I'm going to focus on this consultation. Uh, I hope that helps. No, absolutely. I think there is something also to be said that if, if someone does find themselves in a position where they're actually unable to put their phone away and stop thinking about it and and it is judging you know clouding their their patient consultation or something like that it, it's a time to sort of step back and think actually what can I do and I yeah. that sort of reminisces and echoes massively with what Duncan said often there's a turning point where you think I'm yeah. a kind caring compassionate practitioner and human um but something's precluding me from being able to fulfill that and Often lots of people say doctors are very, have poor self-awareness. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think what happens is we push ourselves with goals and ambitions and wanting to help others that the amount of self-awareness and self-care we want to give to ourselves is often undermined a little bit. But if you've Absolutely. got that niggling red flag that's going there, that would be for your friend who you're worried about or your colleague, just say something. You never know what you might answer for somebody else. And it really does help to, to, to do that. You know, if you know that when you're stepping into the workplace or you're thinking about it before, but, you know, having a chat with someone at work and just just letting them know. Um, because often just that little discussion can also make it a little bit easier. And then if it is at a severe point, then, you know, be honest. They would much rather you didn't make a mistake and spoke up and said, I'm going to have to take some time off. Um, Absolutely. And often the worst thing in the world that someone might feel is about taking a break in training or taking a pause in their career. But actually what we want is a, a community of, you know, healthy, happy people who are working. I would much rather my own GP be somebody who has been rested, who feels that they've had a good support network and can can give me that support. And that's what I'd want for my friends and their friends and family test, as they say all the time. Yeah, to be thinking absolutely. about would we be able to fulfill that for ourselves? Um, Alex, and one of the, gosh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Just, sorry, just, just one thing I, I always say is, you know, the way this government is going with pensions, just remember, you've probably got 40 years of GP ahead of you. So take your time, there's no rush, things will change. You'll take on so many different things. You'll face so many different things during that 40 years. So. If you go less than full time, if you go down in your sessions or if, if you decide to take a break, it doesn't matter. And it's probably a good thing. No, absolutely. And, and your slide on the resources that are available, both financially, but also emotionally, physically are really important. And we will be touching on those again after our session with Claire. I suppose one of the questions, um, one of the last questions I'll come to you with, um, Alex, is, well, someone sort of asked, would you advise the same sort of strategies with dealing with disappointment? So for instance, not getting a job that you were really coveted or the practice that you really thought was for you, but they, you know, they haven't hired you, they've hired somebody else, how to deal with that kind of setback? Yeah, I guess it, it, it'd be interesting if there was some feedback from it so that you could find out why, but also I guess accepting that, you know, if there is one job, uh, unfortunately, it may not be critical of you. There may not be something necessarily for you to, to learn that you need to change. Um, it just may be that someone else was more right. And that's okay because you will find the right job for you. And, and there are 
lots of other jobs out there. Um, and I think we all face this appointment of failure or, or where something does go wrong. Um, and as I said, in terms of sort of advancing through that adversity, you know, picking yourself up and, and being able to go, okay, well, the good thing was, actually, I got that interview experience. Actually, I got to see how another practice worked or they, they fed back and, you know, I did this wrong and then I can learn from that and, and be better for next time. And I think a part of the human condition is that is we will have failures and disappointments and setbacks. Again, as much as we're not immune to mental health, we're also not immune to all of these things of, of, of failing things. And often you do find excellent trainees who have never failed an exam in their life. They've got through everything that they ever want to. And then something just goes wrong. And it's why mm. me? And as you say, it's not seeing those specifically as setbacks, although it might be really difficult at that time, but the opportunities mm. to grow from there and also what you can learn from that and the resources that are out there, which admittedly yeah. I think have been harder to find over the past few years. But now, as you say, this is a real turning point and there are lots of people, you know, 70 plus people listening to this. Hopefully you'll have taken something from listening to these really inspiring stories. Um, so we'll leave it at that, uh, Alex, for now, but thank you so much for, you know, giving your time and speaking to everybody and that river of life. That's something I'm definitely going to take with me as well. Um, and Alex will be looking at some of the questions that people have posed as well and be getting back to a few of you. So, uh, yes, thank you so much again, Alex. Really appreciate you coming. Cheers. You're welcome. Take care. Take care.